Charles Dickens, his great quote, and said, of, of all the great inventions, all the discoveries in art and sciences, the printer is the only product of modern civilization necessary to the existence of free man. It's a powerful statement when you think about that. All of our progress, you think, could that happen without the printed word? This is our story as humans. This is what we're about. What's a book? Okay, so a book is something that's got pages on it and got a cover and it's bound. That's a book. Writing's a love, publishing's a business. Self-publishing is the business of publishing, okay, where you self are the publisher. Self-publishing goes back to the founding of the country. People like Paul Revere and Benjamin Franklin and so on. Way back, I mean, I think like Sophocles or what, I think they self-published. You know, I mean, the whole idea has been around forever. Remember, it takes a large New York publisher 18 months to get a book into print. I had two years of clear sailing. A self-published author, the traditional houses consider them to be like the creepy guy outside trying to get into the party. The growth of Amazon really leveled the playing field for everybody. So why take on a partner? This is much, much more successful if you do it yourself. Nobody's telling you you can't publish any way you want. A friend of mine said, why don't you put something up on Kindle? Why not? What do you have to lose? The internet's a big, scary place. You know, I sold 150 copies and made $250. The primary objective of all being in business is to make money. Even having sold more than two and a half million copies, that first 150 copies meant everything because it meant that people wanted to buy my book. Those chances are better now than they've ever been before because of the tools of self-publishing. The stigma against self-publishing will eventually fade. The story of self-publishing that hasn't been told yet is the thousands of people who are making a living writing. There are lots of people, thousands, who are doing it. A self-publisher can survive pretty well in the world. My novel took three years to write. Like, how much is that worth? But. They have to treat it like a business that's worth the world to me and maybe that's worth nothing to someone else. Not to say it's easy to make a living from writing. But the playing field has been leveled. Obviously you have to start with a great book. Writing a book is a creative act, but selling a book is a business. It's a weird, confusing industry. Unlike any other business out there, none of us have any control over what is a bestseller. You never know what's gonna grab people. So if you don't start with a great book, you'll see it in the reviews and then the book won't sell. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can put out a book that you had no expectations for and it'll do huge business. We've heard of people winning the lottery and make a lot of money. You could have a book come out that you know is a short thing that is gonna be a bestseller and it tanks. Even if sales dry up, even if the self-publishing market dries up, I'm still gonna be writing stories. You don't do this to try to make a living from it. You do it because you love it. There is a last day for everything. There's a last day for your book too. I don't care what it is, it's gonna die. The big misconception out there is that though, that there's no real business that you gotta learn about, you know, that it's just, you know, you're a publisher, I, I just wanna write, you know, and somehow by self-publishing, you know, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm gonna be rich and famous overnight. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. The road to self-publishing is fairly long. Unfortunately, there's a fork in the road real early on. And if you get off on the wrong fork, you're, I mean, you're in trouble. There's a lot of work, first of all. <laughs> it's omnipresent. He just put everything of his own into it. That's what um, makes him keep going. I want to sell books. I want to make a profit. I want to earn a living. But if you're talking about being inspired, I mean, that's to me, that's what this is really all about. You have to take control of the next day, the next week, next month, years of your life. And now's the time to embrace that. Do you like zombies? <laughs> no. <laughs> no okay. Good. It's not about zombies. No, this is uh, this is about uh, a one-year trip around the world that I took. Uh, 17 countries on four continents. Uh, so it's a series of essays about that trip with a variety of different things. I bet my super hot wife in uh, Honduras. There you go. Uh, Slovakia. So yeah. So it's uh, it's just a series of essays, bullfighting, volunteering, a bunch of different things that I ended up doing. Cool, we'll take one. All right. Any any offer? I'm accepting. I'm accepting any offers. No. So no, no. what's your? How are you trying to make it? What do you want? For I'll take it. <laughs> uh, how about let's say three dollars or we'll do the Sunday special two for six. 
about two for 20 in the autograph. Oh, God, I'll oh, shit you on that. How about that? <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Thank you very much. Boom. That's there you go, buddy. Wow. So I would so never cool. thought that he would say two I for 20. Like I feel like that's 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 amazing. That's amazing. The self-published thing. Honestly, I believe that's what it was. I mean, I feel like he. I mean, he said it explicitly. Yeah. Oh no, that. man! Yeah. You're out here trying to make it. You know, self-published. You know, promoting yourself, taking the time. You know. His first book, Scratch Beginnings, was published, and you can see that they put so many little details that he didn't think of with this book that's self-published. It's simple, it just wants to reach out to you and that's that's the way he did it. Ivana is just as much a part of the book as I am. She's done almost as much work on the production of this book as I have. His books have something that reaches out and touches the hearts and the souls of, of a person. My biggest dream was to meet Adam and I didn't even know about it. And our next dream is probably traveling some more and um, just living, living the life together that's our, that's our dream. <laughs> so you need a number of books to send out as um, review copies and promotional copies. And of course you want to sell some. And if you're a professional speaker as I am, you sell books what we call back of the room. People um, can get the book autographed. So you, we wind up selling a lot of books that way. You have to do the promoting. I go out and I, I speak a great deal. I travel all over the world. I do 6,000 miles every week. But I do that for the book. And frankly, the author has to do the promotion. My expectations for this book are for it to be huge. I want hundreds of thousands of people reading this book. I want people to be inspired. I want people to read my book and take action and say, I'm taking a trip just like this. I wanna go on the Today Show. I wanna go on Good Morning America. I wanna go on 60 Minutes. I wanna go on these big TV shows to get this message out. And I wanna do that because I have the potential to build the life that I wanna build with Ivana. I mean, she has transplanted her life from Slovakia to come here to start over brand new in a brand new place where she knows no one except for me. She is the reason that I'm doing everything I'm doing, period. We have the opportunity to build our lives together with this book for this to be our dream instead of just my dream. This is the magnum opus. There is no other book that I'm working on or other business. This is it. My agent called me and said, hey, I got this school, University of Pikeville in Kentucky. They are considering using your book for the freshman common read. So I'm here to speak about Scratch Beginnings and I brought a box of my new book, One Year Lived. I'm just gonna have them out there, $10. If you want a copy, great. Adam is the author of the book that my first year students are reading as a required first year common reading. I think someone like him might inspire people. Maybe they can learn there is life outside of the university. There's life outside of Pikeville. There's life outside of the mountains, or at least um, take away some kind of perspective change on the world around them. Attending Merrimack College on a basketball scholarship, Adam Shepard graduated with a degree in business management in Spanish. Shortly after graduation, with $25 to his name, Shepard departed his home state for Charleston, South Carolina, embarking on the journey that he chronicled in his first book, Scratch Beginnings. Since the whirlwind journey that took his self-published book to the Today Show, CNN, Fox News, and NPR, he has sold his book to HarperCollins and made appearances on the Dave Ramsey Show and 2020. He also recently returned from a one-year trip around the world Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm University of High School welcome to Adam Shepard. Isn't it remarkable what we have the potential to accomplish when we step outside of our comfort zone? Who we have the opportunity to meet when we step outside of our comfort zone?
Big publishers don't promote books. All they do is have the book printed and they stick it into distribution, which means it goes out to brick and mortar stores and now it goes out to the online stores. And that is it. They don't do anything else for you. When I have the rights to this book and they cost me a dollar a book to print, I can buy a bunch of copies and mail them out and make connections. That's an advantage. I don't have any patience for a publisher trying to sell me on this is a rich tradition that should somehow be preserved. That's bullshit. Forgive me, but it is, and they know it's bullshit too. <clears throat> and the reason they've clung to this rich tradition is because there's never been any competition to force them out of it. One dream involved a cemetery and a town full of dead people, and the other dream involved taking a tour of like, the sort of like rehab prison facility, and my novel was there. And people had read it, and when I was there, like, oh, you're the guy that brought that to us. And I was like, yes, I am. They're like, oh, you make our job harder. And I'm like, I don't care. Because Vita was all about accepting, you know, yourself and pushing society away and realizing that true perfection is always within the self, and we are all perfect beings. This is not a book, this is a dream. Open the pages and fall inside. There's no escape. <laughs> right, well, today I uh, met up with Rod just to finalize the plans for doing a reading in his shop, the, uh, the Little Leviathan. There's so many more ideas I have now with how to, how to get this reading to actually to flow with the area and you know, with the people that'll be here. I, I, feel, I feel comfortable in a place like this. I feel very peaceful, and I think that a lot of that reflects with uh, the attitude I take towards my writing. Andy and I met at camp when we were 12 and 11 years old. We exchanged addresses, and we, you know, this was before the internet, so we would write letters every month to each other. I had some friends use it. They, um, they didn't like it. They were a little spooked out by it. He would write me stories or letters and, and draw pictures as well. He had his, you know, live journal and, um, you know, I knew him in college when he would, uh, you know, take breaks and write stories. He would take breaks from work and write short stories. Um, when we lived in our first apartment together, he would kind of dip out and have a smoke break on the patio and just write. And I think that's when he was writing Bidu. He would just disappear for a few hours and just write and write. It was never anything that I ever knew that he would wanted to make anything of it until, again, we had that conversation after Birdie was born and it seemed like he was missing something and that's where I pushed him to make Vidu a reality. Yeah, but I'm going to build robots and write books when I'm You're going to build robots and write books when you're growing up? Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh-oh. <laughs> We have books everywhere. They have books in their room. Brody is interested in learning how to read, so Andy has decided to teach him how to read. We practice in the car on the way to preschool every morning, um, and he's really cool about it. He is a king of all things. Self-publishing has absolutely changed Andy. Brody loves it too, you know, this is a way for him to show, you know, hey, I, I did this. I, I, I've finished something. I, I put my heart and soul into this book. I've, I've completed it myself and it's out there. I think I saw Citizen Kane for the first time freshman year in college and um, just fell in love with it. 
it's still just a powerful film. It's a testament to a man's determination to control his life, like every aspect of his life, and make sure that the way he wanted it done, it would be done. And if you are getting out there in a business sense, if you are putting yourself out there in a creative sense, you, you have to be like that. You have to be, you know, forceful enough to make sure that you're true to yourself and your product is true to who you are. The thing is, what's changed most fundamentally in, in the publishing world is this. It used to be that authors needed a publisher. It was a necessity. If you wanted to reach a mass market of readers, you needed a publisher. Today, no author needs a publisher. Because of the advent of digital publishing, what authors are now saying accurately is this. I don't need you anymore. I'm looking forward to new people discovering Andy and, and his writing. And um, if he gets a new follower from this, it's a success. The talking in front of people is out of my element. It's, um, I've got the same kind of nervous jitters that I had on my wedding day. Lasted for, you know, about an hour or two before the wedding, run over, throw up in the woods or something, and one of my friends, like, got me some water or something to drink, and which is all fairly the way as soon as I saw Mandy showing up in a dress. Where I showed up late. Yeah. <laughs> we were sh shuttled off elsewhere. I'm Giles A. Anderson. Um, this is what I've written. Consciousness descended, yanking him from a dreamless sleep, but doing little to usher in a full reality. The world wobbled and swayed. Stability to be found only in the steady, hurried pounding of the heart. That was the first chapter to my debut novel, V Do. I uh, self published last October and was like a decade in, in the making. I'd like to thank Rod here for hosting this event. One of the things about self-publishing is you're doing it all yourself. You don't have a publicist or anyone to help you. So finding uh, a place like this, it's kind of off the beaten path is just excellent. I mean, Vito is it's kind of an off the beaten path kind of book. <laughs> um, not many mainstream novels are gonna start with someone puking all over the fucking toilet and covered in blood and shit. It's just, it's how it goes. <laughs> Andy, I felt like it was my obligation to give him a shot because he believes in what he does. He had something in his head he had to get out. And I salute him for giving his honest, pure form, like an artist. As far as what I do, everything I have here is something somebody else made. I would love to say I had an original creation, but I don't. I can tell he's very passionate. He's still in that, like, totally into what he's doing, wants to get a message out there, self-published, so. To me, that shows a little bit more like drive. Somebody really has to have drive if they're trying to get their message out there by self-publishing. I was expecting five, ten people, and we, we had more than that, and we had a broad array of people. I love meeting people who um, have a taste for just uh, what most people would call the odd or the exotic or the macabre. Do I see it being a full-time career? I hope, I hope that eventually it will be. You know, we have two young kids. We've got to dedicate our lives to them. He can't leave us for months and months. Our, our kids have to see him nice. and have him as, as their rock. You know, maybe, you know, 18 years down the road when Brody's in college, Violet's graduating school, he can take the time away from us and, and do this. Having a creative career as a mother, you know, I see it in my kids. They're constantly making little stapled books. My daughter came up with something the other day. I was like, no, that's a bestseller. My husband and I must talk about it a lot, and they hear me talking about it. And they see me working on it all the time. Oh, is that one of your books, Mommy? Or we'll go into the store, and they're like, oh, they have a bunch of them in paperback. It's fun. How do you get your self-published book into Walmart? Well, there are distributors that handle the big box stores. However, you may not want to get your book into Walmart. This article is how to hit the shelves in Walmart and why your book is never going to be one of them. <laughs> Sometimes we get an order and all of a sudden a Walmart big box store uh, wants more books and so you invest the money and you go back to press and you send them off and then somehow you find out later that the books were sent to the stores then nobody opened up the boxes and after a few days they closed up everything and shipped them back and there you are with the bill and the books back. Um, I mean, it's, we hear these horror stories all the time. It says Walmart does not pursue self-published books. Wow. Well, self-published books pursue you. 
My new book, One Year Lived, will never be available at Walmart because it is self-published. So I'm going to take the day and make it available at places like Walmart, Barnes & Noble, and Target. I'm going to sneak in there, put a few copies at each place. The idea is that the patron grabs the book, goes to buy the book, and then the manager sees that it's not in the system, and so they put it in the system. Whether it's free or paid for or whatever, I'm going to force feed this book to people. So it's kind of reverse shoplifting. Ultimately, the, the goal is to purchase the book, right? Get the receipt, oh my God, that would be amazing. I want them to know about the book and have the book here, and then it's kind of, oh, you know, because for me to have to work through this crazy system that publishers have to work through, it's just not reasonable. So for them to say, oh, we, there's a book, and we have a couple of guys that want to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one, if you didn't come to my line with all them other hundred thousand my girls, I wouldn't have a job, honey, and I, and I know that. So you know what? I, I know that. This book is not found. So that's what I said. It was like this one over here. Yeah, she's going to put it in the system. So... See, that's another thing. See, that's the 34. But I could frame it next to the, uh, to the, to the dollar. dollar. <laughs> you should do this. Oh my God, this is amazing. That he said, of course. We, we just want your money. Right, right, you know, right, right. We're going to figure out a way to get your money. My first month of self of self publishing was a great big zero. My second month, a great big zero. Um, it wasn't until I released my second book that I started seeing sa sales come in. Self-publishing has allowed me to find an audience that otherwise would not have been possible. Traditional publishers, I think, are looking for, they're looking for what sells. You know, it's a business, that, that's fair. But in certain cases, they're, they're, they're going for the safe sell, not necessarily willing to take chances. Self-publishing allows you to tell the story you want to tell and actually see if there's an audience for it. I guess it's cruising along like I expected. It's, it's hard, you know, having a kid being able to still get out there and push it the way I, I always imagined it, but I, I know I have years still to be able to do that. I'm back! <laughs> I love you. Like you had a good Halloween? Hmm. See you in the morning? Yeah. Rind is two, uh, Shoreline is three. The next one, untitled one, will be four, and then there'll be a fifth one. It's just about this whole family type situation of, um, I mean, it's spanning generations already with the second novel. Yeah, the reading took a lot out of me. Just mentally, just, I don't know. Kind of made me want to, like, if I do this writing thing, I have to do the reading thing, too. You know? it's like, it was fun. It just, I was demolished for two days, just mentally a wreck just because I did the math I was on for like eight hours straight like perky on for eight hours straight like anticipation just, uh, I'm very subdued when I don't like flipping that switch it uh um, it just drained me stay in bed like the whole next day <laughs> I had released my fifth book 
Um, up until then, I was selling in dribs and drabs. And out of nowhere, one of my novels just started selling and it just kept going. It's still, it's still taking me by surprise. But I think, I think the thing to take, about, to take away from there is there's some authors, they will release that first novel and they'll say, okay, you know, this is, this is make it or break it. And yeah, that happens with some people, but it's like winning the lottery. You know, everybody wants, everybody wants to go to Vegas and walk out with the jackpot, but they don't realize that, you know something, if you walk into Vegas and you come out with $50 in your pocket, pocket you're not doing too badly. And that's probably the more realistic expect expectation. And we have to define success. I mean, for me, success means basically being able to make a living writing full time. Different people are going to have somewhat different measures of success, but I think a, a decent, rough and ready, widely applicable one is can you write full time and make and make it? Your chances of success in, in self-publishing are remote, and your chances of failure are high, statistically speaking. And failing to acknowledge that is just kind of sad because it prevents people from being able to make good choices. My name is Dave DeLugash, and I'm a, a longtime friend. I remember seeing a kid with a mullet, and he had these massive hands. So he went to shake your hand, it was like he just, you know, he had the big handshake and you could definitely tell he's from the cell. And had a, you know, big personality, a lot of energy, you know, just a very welcoming person. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And there's a few things Adam did in college. A lot of them didn't pay, but he wasted a lot of money. <laughs> Adam, uh, he wanted to beat the casino. I will, I will have that done. I don't care how much it's gonna cost. He thought he could beat the casino, even though no one else can beat the yes. casino. Thank you, thank you. Now. Yellow Bunny. He was Adam Delusion. I think he probably thought he could really outsmart the casino over a certain period of time with, you know, playing $5 a hand. He thought he could take him for three, four million. He's one of those guys that? where when he does something, it's gotta be all in. I just have to be happy. I'm gonna go one more dollar. So once he started losing, it was a challenge. You know, he didn't care about the money. He just wanted to beat the casino. See, we never knew exactly what he lost. That's the problem, because he'd be going to the ATM, and then he'd say he's going to the bathroom, and then come back with more money, but you never know how much more, you know, money, what, did he get $200, did he get $1,000? So 8,000 was not surprising when he said that that's what he lost. Probably would have thought it'd be more. $14, honey. $14, I hope you love it. When you see chips, chips don't, they aren't money, right? They're, they're an object, so if you were to go put $50 down on the table and bet with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, most people wouldn't do it, but if you take two little chips, you put them down, you don't think about it. That's, that was his problem. He never saw the chips as money. <laughs> Holy crap, I need a hand. It's gonna well, break. I got it, I got it, don't let it break, I got it. Oh, you're, you're just gonna give it to oh, oh. I'm carrying it? I was hoping you readjust. You got it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're sending out 1,222 packages. Interview questions, press release, my publicist's business card, handwritten notes. My wife wrote 1,222 handwritten notes. Got a little CD here. It's got a couple of promo videos on it and then two copies of my book. And that goes to radio and TV and everyone I can find. It's kind of this monotonous routine where you lay everything out on the bed, stuff it in the envelopes, two books in the envelopes, seal the envelopes, put all the packages in the cardboard boxes, load them in the car, down the three flights of stairs, and then we drive to the post office. There's always so much potential. I feel good when I drop these packages off. It's like, Okay, here we go. The one person listening who is going to read my book and it's going to make a difference in their life. The one person listening who's going to hire me to speak. The one person listening who's going to tell all of their friends about my book. That one person is here in these packages. Time is ticking, so we need that one to be somewhere in here. The first time I experienced like, his cooking, I go over to his apartment. And he's got tuna. And he's like, you guys want some of this tuna? The apartment's smoking, like just smoking. 
it's good, it's good tuna. He, and I look at the stove, it's on high, like the whole way through. And I said, hey man, you know, you can turn it to medium. There's like a range in between like on and all the way to high. Um, so, and that's kind of like how he lives his life in a sense where it's like, either he's doing something all the way or he's not doing it all. One of the challenges that I'm dealing with right now is separating the professional life from my personal life. Ivana is brand new to the country and I'm saying, hey, listen, I love you, babe, but I got this book that I'm working on while she is interested in, hey, I wanna stay here longer than my three month visa. Let's go ahead and get this green card. So I have to separate Adam Shepard, businessman, author, trying to sell books, trying to get it out there. And then there's Adam Shepard, husband, trying to get his wife a green card. The USCIS alien number, is that what you're asking about? It is A, as in alpha, 204. So we filed all the paperwork and paid the 18 or $1,900, whatever it is that it cost, and we wait. And that's the most troubling time for us is that we're not getting answers right now. Patience is, is the greatest virtue you can have in publishing because everything is just going to take so much of you and so much time and so much frustration and you just kind of have to learn to roll with it. The dark side of self-publishing is the idea that you can go it alone, that you're going to make millions of dollars, that it's really super easy and fun and it's never frustrating or hard, that it's easy to get reviews, that it's easy to sell books. We used Mandy's suggestion for the other night and I actually did an about the author page that will go on the very, very last page. This was the, what we'd come up with as kind of a concept uh, the other night. And what it ended up doing, hammered it out pretty quickly actually which this ends up being the cover. For me, it's about the entire package. I enjoy laying out the, uh, doing the pagination and laying out the text myself. I like having uh, say so in the, the cover art and how things are laid out, what font is used. These things are very important. And I don't think, um, uh, you know, if you're doing this for the art that you leave those decisions up to someone else. We're here at the airport and my darling wife is dropping me off. I'm headed to New York for three days. I bought this flight about two, three months ago, thinking that I would get some kind of media. And I have one possibility for a radio show. So I didn't get the media that I wanted. So I'm gonna go up there and see, you know, maybe something will pan out, maybe not, but at least to be there. My agent is in New York. Uh, even he doesn't want to be with me because he's pretty upset that I decided to self-publish this book. Uh, so he's not responding to any of my, my correspondence. You know, I'm pretty frustrated about that, but it'll be good to get away a little bit and, and maybe something will pan out this week, maybe not. I got the press release going out Monday, so there's always the potential that something could happen. And my press release is releasing at two o'clock. Hopefully it'll be me a couple of interviews. So we're going to go sit in a coffee shop while my press release goes out into the world. So the two o'clock hour has come and gone. And the press release was a failure. Another failure, perhaps in a string of failures. Uh, is it frustrating? Yes, frustrating. But I think I'm coming to terms with the idea of throwing everything that I can at the wall until something sticks. Here we are, Madison Square Park. That is my agent's office. He will no longer speak to me, so I will not be going up there anymore. I decided to self-publish for a number of reasons. Most importantly, I wanted to maintain control. If this book succeeds, it will be because of me. If this book fails, it will be because of me. It's not because I gave it to a publicist um, at a big five publishing house. Wednesday morning, things are looking up. Sales are still terrible, uh, but I just had a great interview that broadcast to 
300 radio stations across the country. I'm sure sales will come from that. How many, I don't know. It's a very humbling experience to be here in New York this time around. Because the last time that I was here, pubbing a book was Scratch Beginnings, and I was all over the freaking place. I was Today Show and CNN and Fox News. You know, and this time I am going to be reading a book in Bryant Park. So, you know, it puts a lot, a lot into perspective. All of the hard work that I've put in, it doesn't seem to be paying off, but you still have to maintain the hustle. I've got this woman did this so, you know, how to run a computer for like old folks, you know, like me. And she printed 100 copies. And then she printed another 100 copies. She did like 45 printings, 100 copies at a time. Okay, so she sold 4,500 books. And then she decided it was over, and it was over. She left the whole thing feeling very good about herself, feeling very good about the experience. Take the same lady that now has 20,000 books and sold 4,500. She's got 15,000 of them, whatever, left in her garage. She leaves the experience like really unhappy. There's going to be a day when it's over. You want to still have a smile on, you know, that same smile that you had on your face when you opened up the box. Initially, you want to still have that smile on your face when you say, look, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. Got to check them all, make sure they came out of the printer right. Maybe they've had some issues. Upside down book, backwards book. Basically, I'm just checking that it starts at the beginning and goes all the way to the end. Today is my 33rd birthday. Probably the most expensive birthday present I've ever gotten myself, but probably the best. I, I wish it was my 23rd. But, uh, you know, there's, there's still, uh, it's time to make this work. 75 kind of was a happy medium. You know, I don't want to order well, hundreds of copies all at once and have them sitting around forever, even though I can get them for really cheap per book. I'm sitting around with all this inventory that might never move, taking up space in my house. I've created this from start to finish. I've designed it. I've done everything every step of the way. I've made sure that it would be what I wanted it to be before I released it onto an unsuspecting populace. It's like that period at the end of the sentence. It's like reaching the end. It's a job well done. A legacy publisher has to sell at least four times the number of books for me that I could sell on my own for me even just to break even. Can a legacy publisher do that? And I decided, no, I don't think they can move 4X the titles that I can move on my own. So I looked at that St. Martin's offer and thought, I'll make a little under 150000 a year from this contract for three years and then that's it, I'm done. Whereas if I self-publish, self-publishing and digital publishing is forever. There's no shelf life. There's no stores pulling the book from the physical bookshelves to make room for new inventory. You make money in self-publishing forever. The $60,000, $70,000 a year thing kept going forever. So then the question you have to ask yourself is this, as I did in that situation. Okay, how much do I need the money today? And it's not that complicated a question. Um, it's like if somebody came up to you and said, hey, would you like $50,000 a month for a year rather for the rest of your life? Or would you like $500,000 right now? That's not that hard a question. <laughs> you see that? 12 books. <laughs> That's how many books I sold uh, last month. I got an email recently from, uh, from a friend who was sending me kind of a report on this guy A.G. Riddle, who wrote The Atlantis Gene. And A.G. Riddle's book came out right about, right at the same time mine did. He sold 70,000 copies. He sold 1,000 books a day. That's what he's averaging, 1,000 books a day. I sold 12 last month. Uh, and so, and so my, my frustration um, is, you know, who, who the hell is A.G. Riddle, right? I mean, who, who is he? His, his, his mom, edited his book, right? His mom edited his book and 
I had four editors that I paid pretty well. I really, I went through this long, extensive process that was that was really a challenge for me. His mom edited his book, and uh, you know he's selling uh, a thousand books a day. So, so, so I mean, but 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 I mean, who who is he? Is what is what I'm really I mean, who who what you know what I mean? Um, he's he's selling a thousand books a day uh, I sold 12 last month on, on paperback I mean I don't even I don't even know what to really say about that I mean good Lord I mean what is there to say about that this baby boy what number do you think that is right there that's the number of the books per month, the paperback? Last month. Really? How's yeah. that possible? <laughs> That's this the $63.24 question right there. Why is that happening? You know what I mean? Got some ideas. So. And that's the implementing sort. What? Tomorrow I'm going to bed. Already? Yep. There's a couple of people up here who want to get a couple copies of Wren. So I am making the trek all the way out here to Creedmoor, North Carolina to sell a couple copies of Wren. So, how many copies you want? Five. Five, not almost signed. Oh, hell yeah, you know I want signed. Right. I definitely want Ever have those days where you're like, oh, maybe this won't work out? As long as people are there reminding you that you are doing something awesome. So I need to focus a lot more on getting myself out there and visiting you know, people, places, tagging cars, just doing anything to get the word out. The artist in me that wrote the book is more than pleased that people are reading it. The Part of me that's developing to realize that I could do this self-publishing thing and become an actual, like, kind of a, a publisher, like, is realizing that publishing, publisher part is happy to have the funds to be able to continue doing this. Giving a rough timeline, maybe by 2020, 2025, I will be branching off and really getting into this publishing thing, or I will decide I have reached its conclusion and that will be the end of my writing career. I don't know. Well, let's talk about how many should you print. Uh, 500. When anybody uh, prints a large number on the first print run, they probably got advice from the printer. So, um, based on your sales of that first 500 and getting feedback from people, uh, and you haven't invested any money yet, you might print 500 more, you might print 3,000, you might uh, print more than that, but at least you have a track record. Currently we are at my storage unit where um, I house a number of books of mine. Now I don't come here as often, but initially I was coming here quite often. I was you know, getting books to, to send out to, for, for publicity to radio, TV, um, journalists, editors, producers. Um, having brought you here because I, expected all these books to be gone. 
between 6,800 and 7,200. So about, about 7,000 books left. It's a pretty special moment to be able to have your book in your hand, all these boxes, you know, that you're loading yourself and there's so much excitement and my book is coming out soon and, and I'm going to publicize this book to the world. Um, it's a very exciting moment, I think, in any author's life. Uh, but to still be sitting here with 7,000 books is a very humbling moment, uh, I think, for, for any author. I've got to pay my rent money, electricity, phone bill. I've got to pay the book printer. I've got to pay to the post office to mail books out and all the other miscellaneous things. There are so many other things I want to be doing with this book right now, but instead I'm going to go serve steaks and wine. It hurts a little bit to have to go here and, and see all these very nice, wonderful, cool people, um, but who can afford to do things that I cannot afford to do. The entire cost of this endeavor, self-publishing endeavor for me, is $37,000. I thought I was going to be completely debt-free and paying for a down payment for a house for Ivana and I. Did I expect to be here? No. Have sales really fallen well short of expectations? Yeah, and that's obviously frustrating. And so, you know, the question is, what am I going to do about it now? If I sell these books individually, $70,000 in there. If I sell them in bulk, you're looking at about twelve dollars to $13,000. Um, so my thing at this point is I want to get rid of them so that people are, because I know people are reading the book. So I don't care if I make 12000 or 70000 Right now they're sitting in storage nobody's reading. You know, the $59 a month for the storage unit is just bleeding my bank account every month. So I want to figure out a way to get rid of these. There is no formula for pricing a book. What you do is you go to a couple large bookstores, you go to that section where your book is going to be, you go to Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and you look for other books as close to yours as possible. Different categories go for different prices. Now, just for example, if you have a travel book, I hope you don't because you can't make any money on a travel book, uh, a book that's you know 150 pages probably goes for $11.95. A book the same size, took you the same amount of time to write it, uh, that's a computer book is twenty nine ninety five. So books in different categories go for different prices. You have no choice. Your book has to be right in the middle. If you charge more, there uh, people are going to probably buy the cheaper one. And if you charge less, they wonder what's wrong with it. So um, that's the way you price a book, whether it be a P book or an E book or an audio book. Um, it all depends on what your category is selling for. Today, we're going to be going to a local used bookstore. In their parking lot, we're going to be tagging some cars with some bookmarks that I made up, just as a little bit of a small promo, just to see if it generates any sort of interest on the website. It directs them to my website, Twitter, and Facebook. If it does generate some interest, we might go and have some professional ones printed up, but don't want to drop any money on it if it's going to be a dead end. Do you want to chill with me up here? I'm going to carry him. Do you want to put him on the wipers? Or yeah, put him on the wipers. I'll check to see how many people are hitting the page in the next couple days and just assume it relates to it. Sometimes it works, uh, you know, I get a couple hits, sometimes I don't get any. Slide it in right here. Got a little, not quite long enough, huh? Here we go. I'm not drawing in like hundreds of people or anything, but every little bit counts. Symbol is facing out mm -hmm. like that. Right here. There right. you go. How many more you got? Yeah, one more. You think they're interested in books? Yeah. You think everybody should be? 
Yeah. Here's a little towel. I'll get this one, okay? okay? Good choice. So, well, my dad has two dogs. He, he builds robots and writes books. I'm going to do that, too. I think Birdie will really understand what it means having uh, my books in a bookstore like this. Hey, the books that you have. Yeah, the ones I wrote. Probably when he's about seven or eight and has a cool. better concept of just how you know, society works with stores and everything and what it means to create and sell your own product. If I was a full-time author, I would like to think that I could have a book out in a year from you know setting down and getting it edited and everything if I didn't have any other concerns. But um, you know, with you know, still with the family life at home and everything, there will always be things that come into play. <laughs> hey, hey, Bertie. I'm hoping that my third book would be available in print in about two years or so, but I haven't even finished writing this one, whereas the other two were finished before I even published Vidu. Uh, apparently Superman has a family. That's news to me. To get Vidu out there, um, it's been a you know roughly a 10-year project. Um, Andy and I have been married now for almost seven years, so that's been the bulk of our relationship together. But it's been pretty cool to get it out there. It's neat to actually see it on the shelf. Rin, uh, we got it out in the last year, which is pretty wild considering we had a newborn. <laughs> you know, we kind of focus on the used bookstore versus, you know, a place like, you know, the big names, Barnes and Noble and, and so forth, because they actually care about their local people. When we looked at the big names folks, and you've got to really put a lot of money into it before they give you any at all. So Andy set up a book signing here. You know, we have our community here where they want to support somebody locally. Where are we going? This is a special day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What do you think? I don't know, I don't feel any car. I was trying to look in, I was trying to hold it up to the light and see. No, the car is, uh, you know. I know, that's the thing. It, it, it probably won't be a car yet, but I hope it's an approval. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Please don't ask us This is your notification of the service's intent to deny your application to register permanent. Try to leave it. The alien, what the f What does that mean? Notice of intent to deny uh, your application to register permanent resident or adjust status. Um, so essentially, if we don't file this paperwork, they will deny Okay. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. There you go. You want a copy? Yeah. There you go. 
Thanks. The actual one? Hold on a second. You gonna sell one of those on eBay? Hey, you guys know where Harris Hall is? <laughs> Harris Hall, Harris Hall. Here, take a book with you. Happy birthday to you. All right, yeah, he's, he's Adam. He is the, oh, author. Yeah, Adam. He is the author of this book. There you go. Sweet. It is. No? Forget yeah, not about Jesus. It's the book. I'm so excited. What's your name? My name's Mary. Mary? Nice to meet you. Where are you headed? You going to class right now? or? And where was this picture taken? Wake out at County, Guatemala. This is great. Yeah. Wow. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, she said no thank you. Yeah, she said no thank you. I want your propaganda. Here you go. He said, can't argue if it's free. Here you go. That's my book right there. Enjoy. Yeah. Here you go, sir. That's my book right there. Thank you. Yeah, you want? Thank you want a copy? You. Put it, uh, what is it? You do, you do. You want a copy. Okay. Right. That's, my, that's my trip around the world right there. Oh, cool. One year. Hey. I, met my, I met my super hot wife. She's right over there. Okay. Yeah. Are you a stay soon? No, I'm not. Okay. But this is the spot in Raleigh to pass out books to college students. Hi. So awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Thank uh, you, sir. What's your name? Uh, Greg. Greg Wilson. I'm Adam. Greg. Oh, okay. I'm Adam. Yeah. Nice, nice to meet you. Adam. Yeah. Thank nice you, Greg. sir. You're welcome. Greg Wilson, academic advisor. That's why I want to give the book to you. What's the point of me taking the book if you're not? If I'm not going to sign it. Right? <laughs> what is your name? Jasmine. Jasmine. Nice to meet you. Very Adam. nice to meet you, yes, Adam. Good, we've gotten good luck with that. Thank you very much. That's very ambitious of you. Is uh, how did you get it published? Um, I've self-published it. That's actually. what I thought. What? Yeah. That's excellent. J A S M I N E. That's correct. Yeah. You're an excellent speller as well. <laughs> I am familiar with self-publishing, vanity presses, but self-publishing is, I think, the wave of the future, and very, very good. I do think that there's a saturation problem in self-publishing. I think that there is such a rush to get stuff up and there's a rush to down price. It feeds into that stigma of self-publishing being sort of like for hobbyists or for people who don't really know what they're doing. And it's a problem. Your responsibility as an artist is to put out the absolute best work that you can. Randomly on Twitter one day, I get uh, mentioned that someone's reading Vidu. She posted a picture that she got a copy of Ren, but it wasn't signed. And I noticed from the cover on it had the Paul Forge price tag on there. I was like, oh, well, okay, this is a local person then. And I knew that I was wanting to do something at Poppers, so that's when I went ahead and set that up. And then it was like, hey, by the way, doing a reading. Uh, you, you want you to come out and we'll get your book signed. The Little Leviathan reading was one of those kind of like invite only. It's a local place that he's willing to put focus on local authors. Of course I'm going to want to go there and do a reading and actually meet people. You know, I'd be silly not to because this is my chance to still get my name out there. I'm still at that part where I'm trying to build a base. I can't just think about now. I got to think about hopeful future success. My parents have just gotten back from a trip uh, probably about a week ago or so and weren't sure if they were going to be able to make it down to the uh, reading, but they've shown up and that's pretty cool. Uh, they haven't really seen what it is I do other than the finished book, so it'll be nice to let them see the other side of things for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, um, so I am uh, Giles A. Anderson, a uh, local author, live over in Garner. He was the boy of a thousand faces, and the weight of life was still just a distant shadow instead of a yoke around his neck. There was a bird, perhaps a blue jay, maybe a finch. The only thing that caught his interest was that it was dead, but they only found the spongy matter that it had to be the infamous bird brain. It looked like a mushroom and was tougher than the rotting skin. He flicked at it with a piece of bark and jerked back when it popped out and rolled towards him. Yes, I, I wanted to bring this... The, the concept of the tragedy, I feel it's something in literature that's definitely been lost. I'm really trying to make books art again. I don't want to just be the author who's doing it for you know, the monies and everything. I want to I want to create the art. I want, I want to be a writer. Did you ever give it to someone to read and then they were like, are you okay? <laughs> the ones who um, don't know me quite so well would kind of be like, you, you got issues. Yeah. I'd be like, well, 
Oh well, yeah, we all did. <laughs> I embraced mine. Um, but uh, these are my parents over here. <laughs> I bought that. I did one of the first proofreads years ago, and I'm really worried about it. <laughs> this is awesome. Like, it's good for people to come out and just, you know, like I said, support the, not just the local authors, but the, the art community in general. I do have copies of both books, too, um, and if people have one and want it signed, I can definitely do that. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you for getting this. Excellent, thank you for coming out. I just wanted to be in Josh in the room. Thank you. That's my bucket list. Yeah. Don't edit me out. Don't make that happen. That's my dream. <laughs> it was great to get to meet you. Well, thank you for coming out. It's been great. It's really nice. You know, see you on Twitter. Yeah, see you on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've been saying for a long time that New York, uh, since long before the Department of Justice launched its own uh, suit on uh, collusion and publishing, I've been saying that New York essentially functions like a cartel. I don't mean this to insult anyone, although I, I recognize that being called a cartel is not uh, something that most people would find flattering, but I judge whether a system is a cartel not by, their, by, by the system's intentions, but rather by its results. What's going on below the waterline is this. Look, we're all going to just pay off their 17.5% of uh, digital royalties cool because we don't want to start competing on that. It's going to cost us too much money. It's going to upset this cozy system we've got that's working out so well for us. Are we cool with that? Yeah, we're cool. Legacy publishing is not opposed to getting more books to more, uh, more readers in, in um, a more effective, uh, more cost effective way. But those goals are subordinate to the main goal, which is preservation of the establishment. We're going to pick up uh, 10 more boxes um, because yesterday went so well. Students alternate days of classes, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. To give away another 500 books would really create a buzz around uh, NC State's campus. What's your question? Reset. What's your question? How does it make you feel like to, to just give out those books for free? That was not your intention. Yeah, but it's good promotion, though. That's what you wanted to do with it? I mean, with all the, of them? Not from the beginning, but I mean, I mean now, right? What do you mean? What, I mean, what, what's, your, what's your point? No, my mean, point is that you could have thought it through, not have this many books. Because do you think that these books are going to work out the same way as a different... I could have thought it through. Oh, that's what I forgot to do, is think it through. You know what I mean? There are very many things that you can... Of course, I, of course I thought it through. It just didn't work out like I intended it to work out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's not like I said, I'm going to order 10,000 books and let me give away 9,000 of them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not that's not what I thought from the beginning, you know. You're taking too much of a risk. What do you mean about uh, too much of a risk? Listen, listen. I okay, okay, okay. It is a risk. It is a risk. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that it's a risk. But it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things for you. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna go all in. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that risk, right? That's well, what, what about but, the future? I mean, what about the future? The... What about the future? What about the future? Not worried about the future. Money. You're gonna talk about money right now? This is because because that, that that that's a fair argument. But what you have to understand is that this is my money, right? And so no. and so no no no. Listen listen. Because people spend money on cars and and going out to eat and going on vacations. And I put all of that to the side. You know all of the all the luxury items. And I spent my money on this. It's just so sad seeing you. Not succeeding that much. Well, if you're frustrated, imagine my frustration. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, this is this is how it works. This is how life works. You know, and I'd rather be sitting in this position right now. You know, than than sitting in the position where oh, I could have gone all in. At least ultimately, at the end, this is where I'm sitting with a shit ton of books. If I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna go down in flames. I mean, that's how it's gonna be, you know? And if you don't give them all out, we can use it for other purposes. And that's the end. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, this sucks. But it, it made me feel so much better when you gave it out to the students so that at least you don't yeah. make money, but you can motivate someone. Give me a hug. This is what I do to blow off steam. This is what I do to, you know, 
mean, things get quite overwhelming. Every, my, my, my life seems to bleed one into the other. It goes from the book to working at the restaurant to the book to working at the restaurant to the book. And, and it gets pretty overwhelming at times. I still have a pretty large chip on my shoulder um, from my basketball career. I mean, I never really achieved what I wanted to achieve on the basketball court. And it's not something that plagues me, but it is there in my past that I feel like I've left something on the table. I feel like, you know, I underachieved. I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. And so I think now, for me, that sits in the back of my mind. Um, so when I'm working out, you know, I'm pushing myself as hard as possible. When I'm, uh, when I'm working on the book, you know, it's, it's, it's the pursuit of the success that I know I can have. Um, and I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. And so, uh, and that bothers me. My obvious skill and I think my obvious talent that is worth developing is speaking. Um, I think I'm a pretty good writer, but I think I have the potential to be a great speaker. I think if I'm gonna maximize one of those skill sets, I don't think it's going to be writing. It's just not my natural skill. I think that speaking is something that I could continue to hone and continue to get better at, and that I could be a top tier speaker uh, in the future. First thing comes to mind about Adam is that he's a pioneer or he's very adventurous. He's the type of student or person that's going to try something or do it for the first time. So, you know, when he was here, it was no surprise in terms of what he would become or what he would do because the sky was the limit. Adam came back last year and spoke to half of our student body about his first book and did an outstanding job. And it was so great the first time that when he got back from his overseas trip, he contacted me and, you know, suggested and we came up with the idea to uh, bring him to the student body again this year. One thing about him, he's gonna bring energy and enthusiasm and he's going to relay that to the group that he's speaking to. Some of you are seniors, some of you are freshmen, sophomores, juniors. I know we have an eclectic mix in here. I want to challenge you to think about what you can do to step outside of your comfort zone. You know, you've kind of got this idea on what you want to do with your life, and this is the direction you're going, and it's very comfortable for you. Imagine if you make your life a little bit uncomfortable. Imagine if you try something different, if you take a risk, right? And that may mean a risk over the weekend, or it may mean a lifelong risk by going off to college somewhere far away. It may mean studying abroad. Something that you, maybe isn't easy. It's outside of your comfort zone, but can make a grand impact in your life. Um, I took a trip around the world, one year, 17 countries on four continents. You have not lived until you stepped foot into a foreign country and sung in their language. Lady in red. I could dance in any country. We hiked a volcano. Um, we ro roasted marshmallows at the top. This is a seahorse that we saw with the scuba diving. Before we saw this seahorse, I thought that seahorses were mythical creatures like unicorns. If you read the book, you will see that in Honduras, with those children, was the greatest part of this entire experience. Of the 12 months, I spent four months volunteering. That is my uh, sleeping bag that is in the river. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for uh, coming in today. I look forward to you. So on behalf of Southeast and all the school, we're going to present you with this as a token for coming. Thank you. And this is his old jersey. And so we're presenting him with his old jersey. He said, he said, I never played defense. So I never played defense. <laughs> Thank you all very much. He signed my book. Too. I will. I'll do that afterwards. Amara's boy. Amara's boy. Anyone else want a book? I want a big book. Yeah. This is who I want to be speaking to. This is who my message is for. This is who I feel my message resonates with. This is who I feel can take what I'm saying and actually make immediate impacts in their life. Are they gonna go fight bulls and volunteer in Honduras? Maybe not. But the idea is there that they can study abroad or they can join this club or they can start this enterprise.
He's enthusiastic. His personality goes very well with the crowd. He just has great charisma and he did a really good job. It kind of really inspired me to study abroad when I go to college, maybe around my sophomore year when he made his bucket list. He really captured the attentions of all the students that were there and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. $65 I made today and that if you consider the expenses of gas, uh, food, the cost of those books, you know, I probably very nearly basically broke even um, today. So, which I'm happy to do because I didn't lose money. Um, but even if I would have lost money, I mean, this is an event that I was going to do regardless. And I feel like it's a very small way that I can pay back Coach Baker for all of the many hours and many days that he's made a positive impact in my life. You want that decisive, obtainable goal, okay? That here's my goal, here's my book, where's my audience? I mean, who's gonna buy it, okay? And it's okay to have a, oh, it's good for everybody, but you gotta start small. You gotta, you gotta start with what you can afford. I remember my early writing. I remember my writing from high school. I remember early drafts of concepts that became Vidu and Rim and future stuff and, you know, I, it, it was so cheesy back then, but you know, they did have the concepts, but there was like, I would pick up on certain things that I would see and like just go off on tangents with that. It was, you know, it was high school stuff, but it was fun, it, you know, it was, you know, just learning to get the craft down before, you know, you, you gained worldly experience and you got out there and saw how everything really was. We, we have this limit that we're given. We don't know how long it is, and so we rush and rush and rush, and we try to get all of these things done. But when I see something like my books that will outlast that, that there's a sense that I can't really put into words that you will make your accomplishments until you don't anymore. In Vidu, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a, a few different scenes where the main character is now going through a world where, you know, buildings are collapsing out on themselves. You know, he's retracing his path back home and just, you know, imagined it if it were all in the shape of this building or worse, like with, you know, vines overgrowing and, you know, the, the trees have taken over. What would be there for you in a world like that? Being out here as a kid was where we played and I know these woods. I've got a couple scars from these woods. If, if I could just write professionally and not have to do a nine to five, that would be great. I don't think I would ever step foot in a, any sort of business again, except to be like, hey, you want to buy a book? It's paying the bills right now. It's making sure my home life is stable. At the end of the day, it's a job. I want writing to be my career. I write on my lunch breaks after I finish eating. I usually have about 15, 20 minutes to write. Sometimes I'll sneak away to the bathroom and make a note or something. If you want to write well, you're going to have to get some life experience under your belt. It doesn't matter what you're doing, interact with other people at least once in your life and see how people are from a different perspective. It's all about getting as many different perspectives as possible because that's going to give you a better understanding of the world and it's going to give you a better ability to create a world. I put out the first book, and it did great. You know, it did fine. It did, it did wonderful, and I was happy. And then I put out the second book, and I was like, whoa, what's happening here? When I put that second book out, the first book then re-rose on all the digital charts. And I was like, wow, I put out a second book, but then the first book is selling as robustly. And then I put out the third one, and boom, one and two came up. It's amazing to watch how the backlist, it sells and it sells and it sells. New self-publishers will come along and be like, okay, this is it, I'm gonna put my book out, and my book's gonna go to number one, and maybe it is, and that's awesome, and it totally happens. But maybe it's gonna be book five that's gonna do it, or maybe it's gonna be book eight. Have a little bit of patience. I um, have started editing the quarter of the third book that I had already written, as well as have been coming up with some great ideas for how it's gonna all play out. Uh, I have a concept for the fifth book that kind of ties everything, puts a little bow on stuff, and just really 
sums it up. Hold your focus, pay attention, but also be a little patient and be in it for the long haul. There's a place in self-publishing for every single genre. There's a place in self-publishing to become this standard for publishing. If you're going to spend your time creating a, an amazing story, why not see it through to completion? Do you understand my philosophy? <laughs> Do you know what my end game is here? I don't. I don't understand your end game. I want to start a cult. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, goodness. I think he's going to complete all five books over the course of the next, <laughs> if we ask him, the next 10 years. Um, so we've got two years, two years, two years, two years, and it's gonna be a crazy ride, and uh, we're just gonna keep riding it out until they're all done, and I'm sure he's got plenty more stories in him. The most expensive part of publishing are the mistakes. You don't have to make them. We've done that for you. We put our information out in conferences, seminars, books, and so on. So get as much information as possible. Go to the conferences, um, watch the YouTube videos, get all the books on the subject, uh, go to seminars that people put on on, on how to self-publish, uh, get as much information as possible, and adapt it to your own subject and, and your own use. You don't have to make those mistakes, we've already done it. So uh, avoid the mistakes and avoid the expense. Right now, in my life, I am very frustrated. I have put a lot into this book. Um, and, and it is not uh, bearing the fruit that I would like it to, to bear. Um, and for me, to be 30 years old, to be a waiter, um, it's, it's not where I thought I was going to be. But the conversations that I have had over the years with my father, the biggest thing that I have understood is that you're going to enjoy successes and failures. Ultimately, the most important thing is to have a good woman by your side. I have that. When I came to you and I said, this is my dream, you did not think twice to make it you know, our dream. The end result is less important than the journey with you. I am super proud of you. Adam, I, I, I think that it's uh, some best uh, to most of my myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's some best for my daughter, Piwa. You're the best I could have had. Oh, Thank you. I love you so we have this this is a letter for the united states citizenship and immigration services we got this letter earlier this week um and rather than open it right away um we wanted to open it we don't know yet we don't know yet so we wanted to open this with with you all everybody together it's going to say Welcome to America, um, you get your green card, um, or it is going to say, you know, you are not approved. And so my last, my last thing to you, Ivana, before you open this is that I hope that this is an approval, um, but if it is not, I really don't care. You know, if we have to go live in Guatemala or Greenland or wherever we have to go live, you know, out of the country until we can reapply again. That, that is okay with me because I will get to live that life with you. So here it is. Hi. There we go. Today I looked over my notes, read my speech probably about two, three times. 
I feel good. I've done this speech before. I'm ready to do it again. It's just at this point, after I've spoken so many times, the biggest thing is that I have to bring the energy and that's it. If I go out there and get cocky and think, oh, I've given this speech 200, 300, 400 times, then I'm gonna fall flat. But if I go out there, like this is a brand new speech every time, new energy, new crowd, everything, I'm gonna kill it. And that's how I feel. It is a huge relief to, you know, I'm sitting here trying to hustle up one book at a time, one book, two books, five books at a time. I just put eight boxes in the car that I pre-sold to Peace University. They're gonna give one to every single one of their freshmen, you know. They got a deal, I got a deal, everyone wins in this scenario. And that's eight less boxes of books that I have to deal with. I mean, it's good for me to sell that many, that's great, but also that means that 400 plus students are gonna have my book in their hand. And it just seems to me, mathematically, some of those students are gonna actually read it and some of those students hopefully will be inspired to take action in their life. So it's a huge relief to have the tower of books dwindling little by little as we go forward. Tonight is what I work for. Everything that I do, I do so that I have opportunities like tonight. I'm starting to realize a little bit more and more that, you know, maybe I'm not the great writer that I think I am, uh, but maybe I do have a skill of oration that's worth uh, that's worth exploring, that's worth developing. And so everything that I do with the books, all the work, all the editing, all of it, the marketing, all of everything so that I get opportunities like I get tonight. So we'll see what happens. You know, I feel like I've been at rock bottom as far as on stage. My college career, I spent a lot of my sophomore, junior, and part of my senior year on the bench, where all my friends and family, they would come watch me play and I was on the bench. I wasn't getting the minutes that I wanted to get. I wasn't the star that I wanted to be. And so I think because I've been in the spotlight there in a negative way, I had this feeling that it can't get any worse than that for me. That was a very embarrassing time in my life. key elements in the book are applicable to us as freshmen. That's an attitude of success and motivation. With those two elements in hand, I'm sure that we can reach any goal that we set for ourselves, especially now since we're trying to decide what we want to do with our lives. After reading this story, I feel that I can succeed and accomplish any objective that I put my mind to. I would say most excited about Ilana being here because she's never seen me in this environment. All she knows is Adam Shepard, the server. She doesn't know. She doesn't know this guy. This is how it used to be. This is how it used to be. I'm getting a taste of my past. <sighs> Hopefully a taste of the future. Whenever we're down to two minutes, just come get me. I'll come out there. All right? Cool. Great. It's easy to have a family here because I know they love me, you know? So if I suck, we're still going out for drinks afterwards. You know, I've got to appease the rest of the crowd. It's crazy, I've done it so many times. So many times I still get nervous, it's crazy. But every single one is different, every single one is new. Every single one, you know, has a different flavor to it. There's always the opportunity the audience will hate me, always the opportunity they'll love me. And I can make that difference right now.
Can I tell you my name? My name is Ron Pramshay, bro. I'm president of selfpublishing.com. I've been in this business 40 years. <clears throat> I've been self-publishing, dealing with self-publishing for the whole 40 years. I was a self-publisher. My name is Rick, Rick Gualtieri. I've, uh, I've, I've self-published 10, actually nine novels so far. I'm working on my 10th. And I'm best known for a series known as the Tome of Bill, which is about a geeky uh, vampire, um, you know, gamer, nerd, who's somehow tasked with saving the world. So, horror comedy. Bella Andre. I am best known for a contemporary romance series about the Sullivan family. The best way to describe my books is fun, sexy, emotional stories, love stories. And uh, I've always been a huge romance reader, and uh, I, just, I just love it. So one day I decided to write my own, and the rest is history. Uh, my name is Barry Eisler, and I'm known for uh, writing a best-selling series of novels about uh, half Japanese, half American assassin named John Rain, whose specialty is making it look like natural causes. I also blog about torture, civil liberties, and the rule of law. Sometimes I blog about the revolution in publishing. I guess I've become known in certain circles for that. And uh, I spent three years in a covert position in the CIA, and that seems to get brought up um, with some regularity too. So I, I guess those are the things I'm known for, novel, novels, blogging, and former CIA. My name's Hugh Howey. I've been writing since 2009. Um, I'm best known for my seventh uh, work, which was Wool. And uh, yeah, it was about 40 or 50 pages printed. Um, it, one of those uh, unlikely success stories where I didn't promote it. I threw it online and went back to writing my novels, thinking this is the least commercial thing I'd ever written, um, which goes to show how, how little I know because it took off and became my bestseller. My name is Rob Hart. I am the associate publisher of MysteriousPress.com. I'm a senior editor at LitReactor.com. I am the author of the self-published uh, The Last Safe Place, a zombie novella, and my first novel, New York, is coming out from Exhibit A Books. Hi, this is Dan Pointer. I wrote the self-publishing manual back in 1979, and it was um, the first really big book on self-publishing. I was writing a column for the Parachutist magazine throughout the 60s, and at some point I decided or realize that uh, I have enough information here for a book. And it wasn't a bookstore type book. You wouldn't put this book into bookstores because, well, how many skydivers go into bookstores? But I did realize that uh, if you went into a parachute store, everybody would be interested in that. So why take on a partner? Why have somebody else uh, dispense this for me? All they knew was how to put books into bookstores. So I published it myself and it took off. 